Okay, Monacy, great to have you here today. Thank you. It's great to be here. First off, glad to have you at Chicago. I think it was a Thank real you. coup for us to get you to be here, and I know it's, it's you're just starting your career as an economist. And how did you get interested in economics, and how did you get interested in the areas of economics that you're working on today? Yeah, so I think I my first introduction to economics was in high school, and I was very I was fascinated by economics as a framework for understanding problems that we face. And when I went to college, I, I studied humanities um, and I felt like my humanities classes were very good at describing problems about the world, whether they were problems of the environment or of poverty, but often not as good at thinking about solutions. And that's where economics stepped in for me. I was very compelled by the framework that economics provides to think about costs and benefits of different policies to address these problems. After college, I went to work at the Hamilton Project at Brookings, and this is a domestic economic policy group that the goal is to translate academic work into material that's accessible to policymakers. So what economists would do if, uh, if sort of if they could do um, anything in the world. I got a really wide exposure to different economic problems. So I worked on infrastructure, on climate change, on poverty. I became more and more interested in issues of poverty and social insurance and public assistance programs. And that's what I study now. I study how they interact with labor markets how they affect people's incentives to work and get educated, and their long-term effects on the outcomes of recipients and on society as a whole. Let me try to parse that a little bit. I mean, actually, I just did, just got done doing an interview with Casey Mulligan, and he was very much informing the audience about incentives and how incentive affects a policy and how policies play into what we see in the world. But I think he started from kind of a fundamentally the same place, which is how an economist looks at policies maybe a little differently than how non-economists would look at it. And one of the questions an economist naturally asks is, all right, you put a policy in place, the world's not a static place. These are not a bunch of rocks that, are, people aren't like rocks that I just go out and I want to break them in half. I hit them with a hammer and they get broken in half and that's the end of the story. Yeah. They might not like getting hit with a hammer. Yeah. They might do other things to avoid getting hit or encourage getting hit, whatever it is. These are people have a mind of their own and they act on their own. And, but it's not just the people that act, it's also the marketplace. There's a ripple effect that happens through the market that, that also we have to take into account. What do economists have in their toolkit that other people maybe don't pay as much attention to? So I think that policy debates about public assistance and social insurance programs tend to be characterized by extremes, right? So you have people on the one on one side arguing that these kinds of programs are panaceas, that they have no adverse effects on recipients or no perverse effects. And then on the other hand, you have people on the other side of the spectrum arguing that they, you know, they they, they create idleness or laziness or they, they have terrible perverse incentives. And I think the truth is that these are empirical questions. There is absolutely a role for preferences in making these kinds of decisions. But I think what economists can bring is empirical evidence on elasticities, on how people respond to incentives created by programs. Some of my research has been on the Supplemental Security Income Program, the children's program. So this is a program that provides cash benefits and Medicaid to low-income children who have disabilities. And this is a rapidly expanding program 
most of the surge in enrollment has come from children with mental conditions like ADHD, like speech delay, and there's been substantial controversy in the media about you know, the, the expansion of this program and whether uh, it is helping or hurting kids to, to have them on this program. But basically, zero empirical evidence. Economics provides a, a, a framework for thinking about trade-offs, that on the one hand, you provide households with income, and that can be very beneficial uh, to the household in providing for these children, especially if they have a disability. On the other hand, the inherent nature of public assistance and social insurance programs is that they that they create incentives for recipients. So there, there, there's a you know as you earn more, your benefits are taxed away. Or if the child is doing better in school, does the family think that the the child will be removed from the program and that they will lose that income? If that's something that the family believes, then that's you know something that we need to empirically measure, right? What is the what is the family's response? And so I look at kids who were removed from this program when they turn 18, and I can I, I use variation from the 1996 welfare reform law, and so I can see them more than 15 years later when they're adults and look at how they're doing in the labor market. And I find that the kids who were quasi-randomly removed from this program are earning a little bit more in the labor market than the kids who stay on the program. So you do find there is a disincentive effect. So you're, you're saying... It depends on what you mean by disincentive, right? Because these are both the effect of actually receiving income, so... Yeah, I understand. You're saying there's an effect of the program in terms of the amount that people work. That's that right. may become either because they're richer or because of some marginal incentive effect. You can't really separate them That's out. Right with this treatment that you have. That's right. But I think going back to what you said before is, I'm gonna institute a program. It's gonna have some effects because I'm gonna transfer income to the people in this group and that's gonna have some effect. And then there's gonna be some effect on people's behavior that's induced by having that program in place. There's very few, and that's one of the things economists bring to the table to say if you're gonna have a program, it's gonna change behavior, typically. We often can predict on the basis of economics, not just that it'll change behavior, but it'll change in a particular direction. That's right. And, and it changes in the direction that we would expect, where the kids who are removed, uh, you know, either because they've lost a substantial amount of income or because the program um, would, have, uh, would have discouraged them from earning, um, the ones who were removed are earning more than the ones who stay on the program. But if you look at their earnings levels, their earnings levels are extremely low. So the, the kids who were removed from this program are earning $4,000 a year well into adulthood. So I see them in their mid-30s, and they're still earning on average around $4,000 a year. They have basically no earnings growth over time. So if we think that one of the issues with public assistance programs is that they have adverse long-term consequences. You know, they either, uh, they sap human capital or they, or they, you know, increase your distaste for work or something like that. Then, at least in this context, that doesn't appear to be happening. So they, their, their earnings response is basically flat over the entire 16-year period in which I observe them. So they earn extra, but it, the amount extra that they earn isn't increasing as they get older. So if there is an effect, it's relatively a constant effect over time. That's right. 